Hi everyone, we'll be starting in a couple of minutes. If um, you could all uh, make sure you're muted and your videos are off, unless you're a speaker, that would be great. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, we'll be starting in a couple of minutes. Um, just a heads up, uh, if you've got your video on, please take, turn it off unless you're a speaker and please make sure that you're on mute throughout this call. Thanks. <laughs> 
Cool, great. Um, I think we'll start if that's okay with everyone. Uh, hi and welcome everyone to part one of the Police War and Empire series. Um, my name is Ipti Han. Um, I'm the university's coordinator at Campaign Against the Arms Trade and I'll be facilitating today's conversation with the help of my colleagues Ian and Sarah who you'll be able to communicate with um, in the chat box. Um, Campaign Against the Arms Trade or CAR as it's often referred to is a UK-based organisation working to end the global arms trade. Our campaigning is varied and has included shutting down arms fairs, working on ending ties of militarism at universities and taking the government to court. It's actually just been over a year since our judicial win when we took the government to court over arms sales to Saudi Arabia being used in Yemen and halted billions of pounds worth, pounds worth of our weapons being so, sold. Um, today we want to take a step back and discuss how we talk about the arms trade in its entirety um, and its many parts and how war and policing have built an upheld empire. We'll be addressing the absence of policing in mainstream anti-arms trade organizing and asking why. Um, and looking at some of the foundations and structures um, the arms trade relies on and itself reproduces. This webinar series aims to ask, what is the link between war and policing? How should both be understood? And should they be separated? What is the role of war, the arms trade and policing in the making and upholding of empire? Today we'll hear contributions of war, war and policing in and of the, of the UK, Kashmir, Palestine and through borders. This series aims to contribute to a more holistic understanding of war and policing whilst enc encouraging a rethinking of resistance and the reframing of the arms trade. We're so lucky to be joined today by five amazing speakers, scholars and organisers. Well actually at four, but I'll, I'll come to that in a bit. Um, but Adam Elliott Cooper, Arun Kundani, Arthur Zia, um, Nadine and Inani, and we were supposed to be joined today by Lana Ramadan, who's based in Jerusalem. But unfortunately, due to closures um, between Roots and Bethlehem, she's had to take an extra long route home and uh, is unlikely to be able to make it home in time for this webinar, um, which is a shame, but um, I guess indicative of uh, the situation. Um, just before we start, um, just a note on, on format. So this is the first part of a two-part series. This session, we'll hear from our speakers that we have uh, that then have a round of reflections and, and break at 25 past two. So we'll then pose two broad questions on violence and resistance to our speakers before we finish for the day. Hopefully, this will lay some foundations and provide some food for thought for conversation in the chat and feed in for the second part of our series, which will hopefully be much more interactive. The second session will be structured around questions and interventions posed by you, our wonderful attendees in the chat box and in the feedback forms will circulate. Um, and finally, a note on engaging in today's seminar. Um, Ian and Sarah will be sharing articles and resources throughout the call in the chat box. Please do feel free to share your thoughts, comments, interventions and questions in the chat box. Intru introduce yourself if you fancy. Um, these sessions are for us all to connect and think about how we'll use these discussions and platforms and to organize, especially in a time where physical organizing is so limited. If you'd like to pose a question for part two of the series, please type question in caps um, before your question and place a plus sign next to it if you're keen on your name being specified if the question uh, is asked in, in part two. Um, other than that, other than the chat box, um, you can also tweet about this event. Uh, you can use the hashtag um, hashtag war and policing, or you can tweet us directly at CAT UK, so that's C-A-A-T in caps, UK in small letters, or CAT Unis, so that's C-A-A-T in caps and U-N-I-S um, in, in small letters. Um, so I think that's the long, boring bit out the way. Uh, so without further ado, um, just before I introduce our first speaker, just a reminder, if you've got your video on um, and you're not a speaker, please turn it off and please make sure you're muted throughout this call. Um, but yeah, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, um, Arun Kundlani. Uh, Arun Kundlani is a visiting professor of media, culture and communication at New York University. He is the author of The Muslims Are Coming, Islamophobia, Extremism and the Domestic War on Terror, Spooked, How Not to Prevent Violent Extremism, and the end, of, the end of Tolerance, Racism in 21st Century Britain. A former editor of the journal Race and Class, he has been an Open Society Fellow, a fellow at the International Centre for Counterterrorism in The Hague, and a scholar in residence at the Schomburg Centre of, of Research in Black Culture in New York Public Library. Arun, could you set the scene for us and maybe provide us with an overall picture of war, police and empire and how these things link? Uh, 
Yeah, uh, thank you um, for inviting me to, to be part of this. Thank you to all of you um, for being here. Um, very happy to be contributing to this um, campaign against the arms trade, do really important work. Um, so we're here to think through the arms industry and how to, how to uh, deepen and broaden our understanding of it in order to, to more effectively campaign against it broaden and deepen our understanding around questions of, of race, policing and empire. So um, two, there's two things I want to say first off um, about the arms industry, right? So um, the first thing is, it's, it's a mistake, I think, to think about the arms industry in terms of, you know, here's this, here's this, um, this kind of market in, in arms and weapons um, that, that follows these kind of rules of, of the free market, the kind of mythology of the free market. And then the question is, to what extent should the state come in and intervene to regulate that market and set some kind of ethical limits to it? Okay, that's just not the picture in reality. And the state does not have a regulatory role of the arms trade. The state has an enabling role. Um, the arms trade would not exist if it was not for the very close um, intertwining of um, the arms trade and the institutions of the UK state. Right. There's, you know, there's, a, there's a, a whole department in the Foreign Office where civil servants um, are entirely occupied with greasing the wheels of this bloody trade. Um, and, and so effectively, you know, a company like BAE Systems, for example, the largest company in the UK arms business, is, is um, a subcontractor of the UK government, effectively. Right. Um, so to understand how this works, we need to we need to understand um, the kind of overlapping security establishment that that is not just sitting on the boards of these corporations, but is also sitting in um, the, you know, the senior positions in the relevant government departments, the, um, the heads of the various intelligence and defense agencies, um, and, the, and the, um, you know, the people working in universities that have a close relationship with the defense and security industry, this whole web of power that exists in the UK. Um, and it's really that security establishment that we need to understand that's driving things here. We need to understand who they are, how they get their power, what their interests are, um, and, and how we can hold them to some kind of accountability for the violence they're responsible for. Because right now they operate without um, hardly any, any scrutiny, hardly any accountability. Um, so that's the first point. Second point is um, the arms trade is a neo-colonial trade, right? So you can only understand the arms trade in the UK if you understand it in terms of the older histories of colonialism that establish the pathways, the relationships, the dependencies upon which the current trade occurs. Um, again, to you know, think about um, the major companies involved in this business, go, they go back, I mean, they, they openly boast about going back centuries into the history of the British Empire um, under different names, but essentially the same entity. And, um, and, and what is their history? Their history is a history of um, you know, manufacturing the military infrastructure for um, the British Empire um, and then the, the neo-colonial um, empire that's existed uh, since the formal empire ended um, in, the, in the kind of um, years after World War II. Um, so, you know, the, and when we think about the history here, um, we're dealing with a history of colonial policing, right? Is the most appropriate term. So, um, you know, think of, don't think about the Second World War uh, as, you know, think about the, um, the, the colonial bombing campaigns that were carried out. Um, through the 19th, late 19th century, early into the 20th century. Um, think about um, Churchill ordering uh, the bombing of, of Kurdish populations in Iraq, um, simply as he called it a policing operation that was necessary um, to, to prevent uh, colonized populations from resisting the British Empire, right? That's, I mean, that's the history here. And, and as you can tell from that example, the boundary between war and policing in the colonial context has always been blurred. There's no clear distinction between war and policing in, uh, in, the, uh, in colonialism. And, um, and that's because that's, that's by design. I mean, what the, one of the major um, uh, aspects of colonial policing is what's called counterinsurgency warfare, and which, which by definition it aims to blur the boundaries between military violence and police. Violence. Like normally we think of those as separate. We think that police violence operates domestically within a certain idea of the rule of law, and military violence operates according to a different um, uh, legal framework um, involving relationships between nation states. All of that falls apart. That whole kind of theoretical legal distinction falls apart in the colonial context. And of course, that runs right through to today, as I'm going to talk about in a moment. But that's the history that like counterinsurgency warfare, um, you know, 
uh, developed um, a kind of formalized in, in, in the British campaign in Malaya in the 1950s, um, uh, and, then, and then deployed in Kenya, then deployed in Northern Ireland, in, in Cyprus, um, uh, Yemen, and so on. Um, so we're, we're dealing with um, state violence, we're dealing with its history, its manifestations domestically and globally, um, its targeting of different populations at home and abroad. I'm going to talk about the war on terror as a, as a kind of case study of, of how we can think about how these histories continue into the present day. So, and how we can think about empire, policing and race. Um, all three of those themes are central to the war on terror. So, um, the first thing, you know, the first thing to say about the war on terror is um, we have, um, you know, the, we don't know how many people have been killed as a result of the war on terror, but we know that um, we can document at least 370,000 people who've been directly killed in um, the, the violence that the United States with its junior partner, the UK, has deployed in Afghanistan, Iraq, um, Pakistan, just to take those three countries. Um, it's likely that many times more people have died as a result of the kind of um, malnutrition, damage to infrastructure, environmental degradation that um, these wars have inflicted. Um, we know that there's uh, been about 10 million Afghans, Iraqis and Pakistanis who've been um, internally displaced or become refugees. Um, and if you piece it all together, all the, bif all the different bits of data we have and make some reasonable assumptions about um, what we can learn from all of that, it's, it's likely that the United States, along with the UK as a junior partner, has been responsible for um, at least a million um, men, women and children killed um, in the Middle East and South Asia and, and North Africa. Um, over the last 18 years, right? So, like, it, I cannot, um, I can, you know, continue to constantly be astounded that we we have lived through that, and yet there has been so little um, reflection, accountability, shame, um, sense of, um, uh, you know, that this was a, a, a huge crime on the scale of the other major crimes of, of state violence over the last 150 years that has ne that's you know never been addressed there's never been an, any sort of kind of accountability reparations um as you would expect in any other similar kinds of crime so the question is, is you know and that's that's um then before you get to thinking about how what the footprint of this looks like within the uk as a, as as you know we know that the the boundaries here are blurred the, this is not something that's just directed outwards um so within the uk we've seen the use of, of you know, deepening use of surveillance, propaganda. Um, policing has been transformed domestically through the ideas of counterterrorism. Um, intelligence agencies um, that, that would have um, been seen primarily as, as dealing with um, security threats from other states are now spying on teenagers in their bedrooms um, within the UK. Um, the intelligence agencies, the police force, the military in the UK have doubled or tripled their budgets um, and held on to that funding, even as other sectors um, of public services have been ravaged by austerity measures. Um, it's been boom time for the arms industry, for the security industry, the propaganda industry. We, in the UK, um, something like three billion pounds a year is spent on counterterrorism, not in, not including um, the large part of the defence budget that's on counterterrorism. Um, obviously, that's a huge amount of money that could be spent on caring for people rather than killing people. Um, the logic of counterterrorism, of, of national security, um, has spread to every sphere of public life in Britain. Um, we've we've um, passed laws that force teachers, doctors, social workers, um, right down to nursery school teachers to be part of the government's prevent um, program of national security surveillance, um, supposedly looking for the, the signs of uh, Muslim radicalization amongst children and teenagers. Um, it's a program that assumes that ordinary Muslim behavior is suspicious. Uh, it's a program that reads dissent as extremism, as a threat. Um, so all, you know, what we're seeing is the blurring of, of boundaries between the military and the police coming home from colonial contexts. Um, we have military officers stationed um, as part of the war on terror in local uh, police forces. Um, we have police forces um, getting training in other parts of the world in military contexts. Um, we have um, a blurring of the boundary between policing and non-policing public services. We expect our teachers 
um, to, to be um, uh, quasi-police officers um, looking for security threats. Um, now, what is, so, so in order to, to kind of get a handle on this, um, what, what we need to do is think about the deeper structures that uh, underpin these, these global wars, right? And so um, the, the war on terror um, uh, is, is best understood as an expression of what we can call racial capitalism. So since the 1970s, one of the, one of the kind of fundamental kind of economic transformations that we've seen, um, uh, which some, you know, some people call it globalization, some people call it neoliberalism, whatever you want to call it, um, one of the consequences of it has been um, a, a world in which um, huge numbers of people have effectively been rendered a surplus to capitalism's need, needs. Okay, they, they have no, I mean, we used to have a situation um, uh, in, in the mid 20th century where the question was, um, can we um, reduce unemployment so that everyone has some kind of waged work? Um, uh, you know, and, and that temporary period in someone's life when they were unemployed is imagined as a temporary period and it was uh, seen as something that governments were responsible for, um, for minimizing. Um, now we have you know, huge swathes of the world's population who are um, uh, what, what the... Um, uh, scholar Echile and Bembe calls um, unexploitable. They haven't even got the, they would like to be exploited by capitalists, but they haven't even got the opportunity to be exploited. They're completely um, outside of, of the capitalist economy, rendered surplus. And what the, um, and, and that's a process that's racially coded. Okay, that's why um, the war on terror is also racially coded. That's why the war on drugs, which is another part of this, is also racially coded. It's why the war on immigration is racially coded. All these different wars these are the kind of central military actions of the, of the last few decades. Um, uh, all of these wars are effectively ways um, that um, the United States um, in, in the lead position, but supported by other Western states, is seeking to police, to manage, to regulate these surplus populations that are, that are seen as a threat because they cannot be incorporated into um, the core economic processes of capitalism, right? domestically and globally. So in the United States, the kind of mass warehousing, what people call mass incarceration, mass warehousing of surplus, um, largely racialized populations in the United States is a part of this. Um, uh, but it's also the, the way we put millions of people around the world in refugee camps because of their, their, their countries have um, been um, uh, destroyed by capitalism and, and rendered surplus. Um, and we put them in refugee camps away from the West so we don't have to think about um, what we've done. Um, so racism is an essential lubricant of this process. Um, counterinsurgency is his method of operation, whether you think about the war on drugs or the war on terror. Um, and in the final analysis, these wars are multi-billion dollar wars on, um, on the racialized, the colonized, the indigenous, the dispossessed, the poor. What does this mean um, for thinking about the arms trade? Um, it means that we have to think about the arms trade as, as a central part of how this global empire functions. Um, uh, empire is not a, um, a historical legacy, it's a present day reality. Um, we need to confront, it means we need to understand the racism that's central to the way that empire works. It, it, racism provides legitimating discourses and we would not be able to um, uh, be in a situation where we can take the lives through violence, through state violence of, of probably a million people um, unless we dehumanize those people first. Um, the idea that we are living amidst hundreds of thousands of fanatical Muslim extremists is that legitimizing idea. That is an idea that has led to the deaths of a million people, or underpins the deaths of a million people. Um, we need to trace the connections between the domestic racisms and the global empire. We need to be able to connect the issue of, of the racist police killings that we see within the UK with the racist military violence that's been deployed in um, other parts of the world. Um, we need to trace the links between for example, the way there's a prison industrial complex in the United States and trace that to the global uh, so-called black sites of the war on terror. Um, we need to see all these connections between the war on terror, the war on drugs, the war on immigration, um, uh, because in the end, these are all linked together and underpinned by the same um, logic, as I say, of what we can call racial capitalism. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Aaron.
Um, uh, thank you, that was incredible. And thank you for setting the scene and um, specifically um, showing us how, this, how, how important race is in, in rooting this um, overall uh, picture. And thank you also for reminding us of the consequences of the war on terror, which seems to have just moved um, it seems to have been a thing in the past, but um, where we haven't acknowledged the very real life living consequences that are lived today. Um, so thank you so much. Um, next, it would be great to hear on the role of borders within this picture that uh, Arun, you, you set out so powerfully. Um, so often arms companies are the same as border companies. And we've actually seen the collaboration of police, war and border industries and arms fairs like the annual security and policing event, which is organized by the, UK's, uh, the UK government's home office and the arms trade industry body, ADS. Um, the event is a place where arms, border, policing and surveillance companies work and exhibit equipment and technologies together um, and, and government delegations from across the world are invited by um, government, uh, the government arms sales unit, which is the DSO, the Defence and Security Organisation. And so it's an opportunity for relationships to be built and developed between these industries that work so closely together already and are often one and the same. Um, but also to rebuild relationships with governments and states. Um, so I'd now like to turn to our second speaker to maybe elaborate on the foundations of these industries and links beyond the networking and trade, um, but maybe speak more on how these different parts are, are one um, in the project of empire and ordering. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to now introduce uh, Nadina Inani, who is a senior lecturer in law at Birkbeck School of Law and the co-director of, of the Centre for Research on on race and law. Uh, Nadine teaches and researches in the fields of migration and refugee law, European Union law, protest and criminal justice. She has published widely in the field of EU asylum and immigration law. Nadine has written for The Guardian, the LRB blog, Pluto blog, Verso blog, Open Democracy, Media Diversified, Left Foot Forward and Critical Legal Thinking. Her recent book, Bordering Britain, Law, Race and Empire was published by Manchester University in March this year. Um, Nadine, could you maybe elaborate on where borders fit into this picture of policing um, war and empire? Yes, I am hoping that I can. And I think what I'm going to say follows on um, quite nicely from what Aaron was saying. Um, so like Aaron, I also believe that the Britain of today can't be understood, um, analysed and responded to um, with any kind of transformative agenda without first reckoning with its past. Um, if its colonial history and that of its uh, recent imperial invasions were to be put front and centre, we would actually understand Britain not as a legitimately bordered and sovereign nation state, but as an ongoing colonial entity in which racialized people in and outside its seemingly post-imperial borders continue to be made subject to the most brutal forms of racial state terror. So racist violence enacted by the police today can only be understood in the context of Britain's colonial history and recent imperial wars. As Aaron was saying, the invasion of Iraq led to the death of more than 2 million people. Um, and the, I mean, I have a different figure, I guess, to Aaron, so I'd be interested to know um, why his figure is, is slightly lower. Um, but yeah, I've spoken with colleagues, um, including Nisha Kapoor, actually, and we sort of settled on this figure. So, so I'd be interested with the, with the, with the one, where the 1 million figure comes from. Um, and also the destabilization of the region. Um, and it was driven, as Paul Gilroy has observed, by imperial nostalgia and misplaced notions of grandeur. And the war on terror has in turn seen the enactment of counter-terror policing and surveillance measures, which are then invoked to justify institutional violence, ranging from monitoring and reporting of individuals in workplaces and schools under the PREVENT program to extrajudicial killings by police of terror suspects in the street. Britain's borders and their enforcement through immigration laws um, have their origins in British colonialism. So similarly, um, militarized forms of policing in Britain today also have their origins in British colonialism. As Aaron noted, and as my co-authors and I write and think through in our forthcoming book, Empire's Endgame, Racism and the, and the British State, in British colonies, there was no clear distinction between the police and the military. The military was called on for law and order purposes with murderous consequences in places like Jamaica, Malaysia and Kenya when people rose up against British rule. There was no clear distinction between the military and the police in colonies and we can see that these boundaries continue to be blurred in respect of racialized people in the imperial metropole today um, as they are still constructed as threatening or unruly 
and as they are subject to militarized forms of policing, for instance, in being disproportionately subject to being, as I mentioned, extrajudicially kill killed either by guns or by other brutal means, mass arrests and stop and search. Um, this militarized model of policing, which applies um, to racialized people, is of course different to the more traditional policing by consent model that's assumed to apply to white British people. But, but what I want to focus on um, in my contribution is how this all connects to bordering. And so I want to address in particular the role of law in producing Britain as an ostensibly post-imperial, legitimately bordered sovereign nation state, access to which is denied to racialized people with histories of colonial dispossession. Um, and I suppose this invokes the idea of those surplus populations that Aaron was talking about, and in which racialized people within its borders are made disproportionately subject to racial state violence, not only in the form of militarized policing, but also through other methods of internal bordering, state neglect and social murder. As the British Empire was defeated, successive British governments introduced immigration controls, withdrawing the rights of racialized Commonwealth and colony citizens to enter the British mainland. It did so via a legal concept known as patriality, which was introduced in the 1971 Immigration Act. This stipulated that only those born in Britain or with a parent born in Britain had a right to enter and stay in Britain. It thereby made whiteness intrinsic to British identity. In 1971, a person born in Britain was 98% likely to be white. So the effect of the act was to prevent the vast majority of racialized colonial and former colonial subjects from traveling and settling in Britain. This was followed by the 1981 British Nationality Act, which continued this process of racial exclusion by then constructing British citizenship on the foundation of the 1971 Act's concept of patriality, tying citizenship to the right of entry and abode. And it raised for the first time the specter of a post-imperial territorially defined and circumscribed Britain. It severed a notionally white, geographically distinct Britain from the remainder of its colonies and Commonwealth. This move was both materially and symbolically significant. A territorially distinct Britain and a concept of citizenship that made Britishness commensurate with whiteness made it clear that Britain, the landmass and everything within it belongs to Britons conceived as white. So the 1981 Act didn't only signify an end to British colonialism, but was itself a colonial maneuver, an act of appropriation, a final seizure of the wealth and infrastructure secured through centuries of colonial conquest. The questioning of racialized people's entitlement to be present in Britain manifests in mutually reinforcing street and institu institutionalized forms of state violence. The 1981 Act's declaration that Britain was, a phys was physically distinct and legitimately bordered space populated by white people required the implementation of colonialism domestically. The same power relationships which underpinned the British Empire were relied on to ensure that wealth accumulated by colonial conquest was located in Britain, that was then located in Britain, was seen to be in its rightful place. Colonialism was configured domestically so as to maintain the white supremacist order of the British Empire within the post-1981 borders of Britain. The enactment of immigration and nationality laws which excluded racialized Commonwealth and colony citizens from the British polity was thus a crucial transitionary move from the primitive accumulation by overseas extractive colonialism to a more justificatory form of colonialism in the imperial metropole. And Britain has long projected a notion of itself as being under siege by racialized Commonwealth citizens. As Paul Gilroy writes, black settlement has been continually described in military metaphors, which offer war and conquest as the central analogies for immigration. Such descriptors of Commonwealth immigration have included the unarmed invasion, alien encampments, alien territory, and the new Commonwealth occupation. The idea that racialized people posed a threat to Britain carried consequences for Commonwealth citizens and colonial subjects and their descendants already living in Britain. As Gilroy notes, once alien cultures came to embody a threat, which in turn invited the conclusion that, that national decline and weakness had been precipitated by the arrival of black people, deportation became possible, as did the enactment of internal forms of racial exclusion for those who could not easily be removed. Internal bordering became a new mode of colonialism, producing and sustaining the post-imperial project of a white Britain. Such internal bordering has occurred in part through the institution of policy and legal regimes that effectively construct a border in every street. Borders follow people and surround them as they try to access paid labor, welfare benefits, health, labor protections, education, civil associations, and justice. 
the process has been described as everyday bordering and ordering, which, produ which produces new social cultural boundaries. These boundaries are policed by anyone everywhere, whether government agencies, private companies and individual citizens. In Britain, as we know, the hostile environment policy introduced in the Immigration Acts of 2014 and 2016 has resulted in racialized people experiencing nation state borders, no matter their physical location, leading to thousands of people being detained, deported, denied access to housing, healthcare, education and financial services, sometimes with fatal consequences. In this way, internal bordering is a continuum with external bordering, whereby colonial resources broadly conceived are withheld from racialized populations, both in and outside Britain. So racial exclusion has thus manifested not only at the external border, but also internally, as racialized people are confined to sites of extreme deprivation, predominantly in inner cities. And of course, we can look at Grenfell as another example of the consequences of this kind of um, segregation. Um, and of course, in these areas, the police uh, brutally enforce Britain's newly articulated white nationalist boundaries. Gilroy has shown how Britain transitioned from an empire to a nation state, um, uh, how in this Britain, young black people were demonized and constructed as criminals, and how police violence and harassment was enacted with impunity in racialized neighborhoods. These were sites where the National Front demonstrated while the police looked on. Section four of the 1824 Vagrancy Act, SUS laws known today as stop and search, um, was used disproportionately and revived in the 70s and 80s um, in order to be used against former colonial subjects and their children resident in Britain. For Nicole Jackson, this post-imperial assertion is crucial to understanding the meaning of police harassment of racialized people. When police officers as representatives of the state harassed black youth with stop and search arrests, they reinforced the idea that black people did not belong in England. To be English was to be white. Without a claim to residence or the hope of full assimilation, black Britons were cast as the perpetual other within the nation, a colony within the metropole. The act um, had actually fallen into dis disuse and was revived, or was believed to, be, to have been revived specifically for this sort of use. And Jackson argues that the use of stop and search demonstrated a redrawing of the boundaries of the nation and legitimate versus illegitimate citizenry. Because the ordinance was disproportionately used against black people, it aided in their marginalization in society as they were recast as an internal colony within the nation. Two years before the 1981 Brixton uprising, Metropolitan Police statistics showed that of 1,894 SUS arrests made in 1979, 797, so 42%, um, were of black people, even though these groups comprise only 4.2% of London's population. So to conclude, these militarized forms of policing, which target racialized people in the imperial metropole um, today, both mirrors the policing of Britain's former subjects in its colonies and has always worked to reinforce Britain's post-colonial articulation of its borders to justify and repackage as legitimate Britain's colonial conquest and plunder and its ongoing dispossessive effects. The targeting of racialized people um, by the police makes clear that they do not belong in or to the English nation. Um, the colonialism that brought their parents to the metropole can be ignored whilst the police serve to reinscribe the separation, um, their separation of the empire from the English shores. Police harassment and killing of racialized people today must therefore be understood as lingering expressions of empire. And as this cat event so well recognizes, we as anti-racist scholars and activists have to do the work of connecting the dots between bordering policing, empire and war so that we can both understand and work together towards developing strategies to resist militarized imperialism and nationalism. Thank you. Thank you, Nadine. Uh, thank you so much for that powerful intervention. Um, thank you for explaining the colonial roots to both internal and external bordering and the importance of institutionalized violence, which is maybe something we can come to talk about later. But also for illustrating again what Arun talked about, that policing becomes something taken up by different parts of society. Um, we've looked at one part of this big empire making project in, uh, in, in what you just um, shared with us, Nadine. Um, we were supposed to be turning to talk about another uh, and the role of prisons. Um, but for those of you that weren't with us um, at the beginning of this call, I had to explain that Lana Ramadan, who is from Abdamir, um, uh, prison solidarity um, and human rights group actually won't be able to attend today's session 
um, because uh, routes in Bethlehem have been closed and it has meant that she has to take an extra long route home, um, which is indicative of the situation, um, but also a real shame. Maybe before we move on to um, Arthur's contribution, I could uh, just briefly say a few things um, that we were going to discuss uh, with Lana. Um, so to just expand and like link between what Nadine has just uh, said and to what Lana was going to contribute, and we were going to give one quick example of borders in war um, uh, and, and militarism and Israel and, and the UK. And the example is actually of, a, of, of that in, in recent months, the UK Coastal Guard has been testing a Hermes 900 drone, which was first used and developed for the 2014 bombing of Gaza. So in 2005, the Ministry of Defence awarded UAV Tactical Systems LTD, which is a joint venture between Israeli arms company Albert Systems and its partner company Talis UK, a contract which would ultimately be worth um, nearly £800 million for the development of this Watchkeeper drone. Um, we'll post more information about that in the chat if you'd like to know more about it. Um, but the contract itself shows the very clear ways in which these things are one and the same. I guess the point is that these relationships are beyond the more obvious um, arms deals, which in the case of Israel and the UK operate in two ways, uh, with the UK licensing over £376 million worth of arms since 2015. Um, but given all this and, and given the conversations that are being had currently with regards to annexation, with regards to solidarity between black and Palestinian lives, um, and with uh, regards to the response actually in terms of shared policing tactics between states like the Israeli state and, and, and the US, um, Lana definitely was going to have a lot to contribute um, and it's a real shame that she won't be able to uh, be here with us today. We'll still post some of the resources that she shared with us um, in the chat. Uh, moving from one military occupation to another, um, maybe it's uh, time now to introduce our uh, third speaker who we're super honoured to have. And sorry, Arthur, I know it's quite early um, in Colorado right now, um, but uh, maybe um, we could hear from you now. Um, so again, relationships even on the basic selling of arms is indicative of the violence exported by the governments like the UK um, within the last five years. For example, the UK has sold over one billion pounds worth of arms to Modi's government and relationships with the UK, whether they be um, with Israel or India, um, are again rooted in colonial histories and colonial presence. Um, again, we're super luck lucky to hear now from uh, Arthur Zia, who's joining us from Colorado. Um, Arthur is a poet and a political anthropologist. She teaches anthropology and gender studies at the University of North Colorado and has recently authored Resisting Disappearance, Military Occupation and Women's Activism in Kashmir. She's the founder and editor of Kashmir Lit and co-founder of Critical Kashmir Studies Collective. Her research interests focus on military occupation, human rights, armed conflict, resistance, settler colonialism, gender, Muslim women and Islam. Um, Arthur, could you give us an overview of what militarism specifically means in terms of Kashmir and, and to Kashmiris? And maybe what are the similarities and links that we can see in terms of what we've been talking about today and our understandings of vampire, particularly, I think, considering what you've referred to um, in, your work, in, in your own work, um, describing India as a neo-imperial nation. Thank you so much, Iftahal, for uh, inviting me to this uh, event. I'm really honored to be here. And I think uh, I, um, you know, just what, what the speakers have been saying before, uh, I do want to, as I'm talking about India and India's military occupation in Kashmir, I do want to, uh, uh, you know, divert, so sort of like bring this uh, term colonial constitutionalism into effect because Colonial constitutionalism is something that we should be connecting with how India is trying to rule uh, some of the dissenting uh, regions that it has. And also like thinking about India as one of the biggest democracies, largest democracies in South Asia, uh, we tend to uh, not look at the kind of, uh, the kind of occupations that it has uh, within its purview. So Kashmir since 1989 has been under uh, Armed Forces Special Powers Act, and Armed For Forces Special Powers Act can be seen as this act that derives most of its uh, fuel and most of its uh, 
you know, the rulings come from uh, colonial Britain and that's what it's coalesced into. So since 1989, after the armed struggle starts in Kashmir, not that there was not a struggle before that, uh, but after 1989, you have this, uh, uh, this, this law coming into effect, uh, actually from 1991, and this law doesn't come into effect till there's a constitutional breakdown, till the government breaks down in a certain region. And then it takes effect. And what it actually does is it gives the entire powers to the armed forces. And these armed forces <clears throat> in India, if you look at like who are, which are the armed forces in Kashmir since 1989, for that we have to go back to 1947 and we are kind of going back to the colonial rule as the British are leaving the region. Uh, and also at that time, Kashmir is bifurcated into two. Part of Kashmir is won by Kashmiris and uh, it's called the Azad Jammu and Kashmir and it's administered by Pakistan. That's a whole different story. And then you have the other side, which is the Indian uh, occupied Kashmir, also known as Indian administered Kashmir under the UN resolutions. And at that time, you have a military that has already come in in October 1947 from India. But uh, it's just a formal date. But then it's also uh, true that there was military already present in the region. So from that time onwards, you have a militarization of Kashmir happening in different phases. And since 1989, what you have right now is more than 700,000 troops. And last year, there was re-annexation of Kashmir from uh, August 5th, when the complete autonomy, uh, the autonomy of Kashmir was taken away by India unilaterally, uh, without taking people on board, without uh, consulting Kashmir government. So at that time, more armed forces were brought in, uh, more than 58,000 troops were brought in. So uh, what, what we really see here happening is that although uh, what the world likes to see India as uh, a democracy, but at the si same time, uh, we, when we look at Kashmir, we are seeing it from a vantage of this uh, imperial, it has an imperial heart. And that's what's uh, very manifest when it comes to Kashmir. And uh, that's something that we have to consider. And also thinking about colonial constitutionalism, uh, the way Kashmir is being ruled at the moment, uh, the way Kashmir is, has been handed over to the armed forces uh, by India, and the way they rule inside Kashmir uh, is, is, is the colonial heart. It's, it's, uh, it, that, and, and you know, when I think about in my own work, how India has uh, managed Kashmir, and they, most of the policy and, and analysts in India, they, they, when, we, when they think about Kashmir, they never think about Kashmir in the sense that uh, it's, uh, it, they also, in, in, in a way, call it like handling Kashmir since 1947. How, how, has, how has it been handled? So what India plays inside Kashmir is the politics of democracy. It's not a democracy because if we look at uh, from 1947 onwards till the processes that were put into place in 1951, even United Nations is kind of reprimanding India that you cannot hold elections in Kashmir because this is a disputed territory. But in 1951, India goes... Um, along with these client politicians who helped set up these elections. So from that moment onwards, you have, you have a farce of democracy being, play, electoral democracy being played out inside Kashmir. And that's something we have to consider when we are thinking about the colonial heart that uh, is operational inside Kashmir from 1947 onwards. So, so that's, that, that's something that we have to consider. And as critical Kashmir studies as scholars, we have been trying to unravel and trying to kind of peel away the layers of the imperial, imperial neo-colonial power that is India and that it has been operating as since 1947. So AFSPA is something, uh, and, and, and here's the thing, uh, when we think about AFSPA, many people, uh, when we think about human rights violations that are happening inside Kashmir, more than 100,000 people have been killed, both combatants and non-combatants. More than 10,000 people have been disappeared by the armed forces. Uh, there have been more than, uh, you know, at, at this present moment, we have more than 20, upward of 20,000 uh, political prisoners. And, uh, you know, there's large scale human rights abuse happening. And a lot of people like within uh, the Indian um, policy analysis, they think about like how, you know, toning down or maybe human rights uh, abuses going away and then everything kind of being okay. But that's not the case. Like uh, we are not talking about repealing AFSPA, but we are talking about repealing of the entire occupation and liberation of Kashmir, so to speak. And when, when I talk about AFSPA, I mean to kind of like point out that uh, 
what is happening inside Kashmir, the way it's being ruled through the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, and how the complete authority is given to the military, and also thinking about the, mili uh, thinking about the police. In 1989, you had about 18,000 uh, policemen inside Kashmir. These were drawn from the local population. But today, you have upwards of more than 80,000 uh, police inside Kashmir. And these are people who are part of co counterterrorism these are people who are part of uh, counter uh, you know, counterintelligence. So they are collating. And then there are also the militia, which have been absorbed into the police. So what we sometimes see happening in Kashmir is uh, it are the, they're not the remnants of civil war, but they're the stirrings of civil war that are always operational, because these are the police is drawn from the local population. The militia is drawn from the local population, quote unquote, what are called the surrendered militants. So there is this. So those are the armed forces that are actually, uh, you know, extorting, they are ki killing people, and then they are throwing them in prisons. And because of AFSPA, no one is held accountable. Uh, because of AFSPA, there is there's no accountability. Till now, there were 53 cases uh, where uh, some security personnel had been um, had been accused but those cases have not gone any further and they're cold storage in cold storage because you cannot persecute any uh, armed forces special uh, armed forces personnel you cannot persecute any policeman because you have the protection of armed forces special powers act there are several civilian governments again i have a problem with talking about the governance and civilian governance in kashmir because under occupation there's only politics of democracy that is being played out for the international audiences otherwise it's a complete authoritarian occupation that is prevalent in Kashmir. So some of those uh, administrators had taken cudgels with India talking about AFSPA and talking about repealing AFSPA, talking about, you know, persecution of some of the armed personals. Uh, but everything uh, went, uh, you, you know, the armed, uh, the army, the Indian army uh, calls AFSPA its holy grail, that it cannot operate without uh, AFSPA being in operation because otherwise uh, they would be unprotected if they are killing people and, and in Kashmir, that's, that's what's happening at the moment. As we speak today, uh, there was a crossfire between the militants and the army. I don't have the full details of the case yet because the story is unfolding. But what we saw was this young boy, three-year-old boy who was riding with his grandfather. And, uh, and, and what the, the army version or the police version is that there was a shootout. Uh, but it seems like the man was taken out of his car and probably shot after he was taken out of the car. And the pictures that kind of are circulating at the moment is this dead man who is soaked in his own blood. And there's a three-year-old child uh, sitting on his chest. And uh, what the police at this moment did was they actually released a video of taking the kid and giving him biscuits and chocolates, kind of trying to tell people that they're assuaging and they're assuring this child everything is okay. They are dropping off uh, this kid to their home. But at the same time, they're forgetting that they're, they're, uh, they're, they're, they're violating privacy of this child and the pictures are circulating, the video is circulating. And that's how policing actually manifests in Kashmir at the moment. Police is completely collated into the body of the army. It's not, uh, and, and what's happening in the, since 2008 is that they are actually uh, becoming a big part of the counter in intelligence and counterterrorism infrastructure in Kashmir and to think that these are Kashmiris and to think the potential like the potential of the civil war or the internecine warfare that can take place uh, because in some cases uh, and there are, there are scholarly articles written on this trying to kind of like ethnographically look at this what's going to happen uh, you know one brother probably is in in the police and the other brother probably is also working for resistance so that kind of a situation is also emerging and it's 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 been an emergence for for the longest time uh, so so what what we see in kashmir at the moment when we think about policing uh, we we really are looking at uh, an, a de jure occupation uh, that that kind of like manifests the imperial heart of India, and then also thinking about uh, you know uh, war, like how does war unfold in Kashmir? And as Arun earlier pointed out, that policing and war they're both collated, they're they're working together, and in Kashmir it's an in, it's not an invisible war anymore, but it is in many ways invisible because the way India portrays Kashmir situation to the rest of the world, it portrays Kashmir situation as its internal 
uh, disturbance, it's internal uh, dispute, it also calls it law and order situation, it's not calling it what it is. And after August 5th and 2019, when uh, the quasi-autonomy of Kashmir was unilaterally and militarily taken away, uh, what we see uh, India telling the rest of the world is that whatever is happening in Kashmir is being done for Kashmir's development to reduce terrorism. And that's another problem that Kashmiris face, that their resistance is called terrorism, that the res their resistance is collated with the quote-unquote Islamic terrorism that we were talking about earlier as Arun and um, our other speaker talked about since 2001, thinking about war on terror. So now India is, uh, that's an easy shorthand for India. Whenever there is dissent, whenever there are Muslims involved, you have Islamic terrorism happening. And scant attention is paid to the f uh, fact that this has been happening since 1947. Kashmiris have been demanding the right to self-determination. And there are factions that want to be with Pakistan, and those are very strong. And the militant movements inside Kashmir at the moment, uh, they are also uh, the secession, uh, they are also the separatists who want to be with Pakistan. So thinking about that, I, I, I feel like we have to, we cannot talk about Kashmir if we are not talking about British colonialism. We cannot talk about Kashmir if you're not talking about what happened in 1947, otherwise Kashmir becomes a totally uh, different issue altogether. And also uh, thinking about the racism or thinking about ethnocentrism, thinking also about the Hindutva ideology of uh, Hindu supremacy. On one hand, what you have the current Modi government, and I'm not saying Kashmir's problems have been exacerbated by the Modi government. Of course, they have been stepped up, but at the same time, Kashmir's problems have been, uh, they, they are instigated from 1947 onwards. So all the Indian parties, whether they're secular, whether they're right-wing, whether they're Hindu, whether they're you know, other parties uh, from other denominations, all are responsible and all are on the same page when it comes to Kashmir and occupying Kashmir. And that was very uh, visible what happened in uh, August uh, in 2019, uh, when most of the parties, they had this problem uh, when Kashmir was re-annexed and the autonomy was taken away. Many people were talking about, uh, many parties in India, they talked about that this is, uh, they, they did not have a problem with the autonomy being taken away. They had a, they had a problem uh, with how the autonomy was taken away without asking Kashmiri. So they were pretty much on board with the autonomy being taken away. So that has been in the in the making since 1947 that Kashmir's autonomy was so slowly and steadily eroded. Now with the Modi government, what they're actually doing is because uh, uh, autonomy was taken away and the territorial sovereignty was taken away from uh, Kashmiris, which me means that now Indians can have right to franchise and they can come inside Kashmir and they can uh, establish their citizenship. And that has been happening in the last one month after India changed the domicile law. Now people from India can actually, with certain, there are certain categorizations and they have to have certain, spend uh, some time inside Kashmir, but it's really settler colonialism on steroids and uh, the militarization of Kashmir and the way army is holding on to Kashmir, that kind of facilitates everything that's happening because dissent is curtailed. No one can speak at the moment. Kashmiris inside Kashmir, they can't speak. Uh, Anyone speaks, anyone writes, they're thrown into jail. And that's what we have seen happening more and more since the last, um, last nine, 10 months. So what, uh, so what India is also like, as we see the general um, political and also the scenario that's unfolding in India with the, the ideology of Hindu supremacy, we see that Muslims are made be, uh, in, into second class citizens. On one hand, you know, the, India is hand in glove with Israel, with the arms trade, with the intelligence sharing, and India has a defense budget of 57 billion, and uh, uh, Israel is one of its uh, one of its very solid. The bedrock of the relationship between them is arms trade and uh, also intelligence sharing. Uh, what we see happening is uh, that that on one hand the settler colonialism is really, really following the Israel model and trying to understand, trying to kind of like uh, derive everything from uh, what Israel has done inside Palestine. On the other hand, uh, they're also like uh, attacking uh, Muslim indigeneity, kind of like thinking about Muslims as not indigenous people and thinking about only Hindus as indigenous people inside Kashmir and then kind of having this narrative that these are people who have come from outside, which is not really true. And uh, sort of like emptying Kashmir 
for uh, the Hindus and Indians who are coming from uh, main, uh, who are coming from India. So that kind of these two opposing. Uh, so on one hand, it's uh, the neo-Nazi ideology or maybe Nazi ideology, but at the same time, you know, when we think about Israel uh, being the the vic victims of that ideology and. So it's kind of like, you know, it's unfolding, but it's also interesting to see how India is kind of like selectively taking all these threads and making this big narrative, especially around Kashmir to uh, make sure that settler colonialism is happening. And as we speak, it is happening, uh, it's, it's on steroids. If, if you do not have, uh, if a bureaucrat doesn't, uh, doesn't issue the certificate for domicile within 15 days, uh, there is a fine of 50,000 Indian uh, rupees. So this is the first time a bureaucracy is being pushed to uh, issue these domicile certificates as soon as possible. And uh, no one can really, uh, and, and no Kashmiri can really uh, protest that because uh, you uh, are, uh, you know, naturally, if you're saying something against the Indian government, uh, you're naturally put in jail. Um, re recently, someone, uh, one of the, he, he's a vocal voice, he talked about something and he's he not even in Kashmir, he's been booked under sedition. So we all, as we're kind of like speaking, uh, what we see is that there is the, the, the mil heavy militarization. So thinking about Kashmir is it's 8 million people and then you have more than 700,000 troops. So you have one soldier for eight Kashmiris. And I think the number is increasing. And if you uh, go into Kashmir at the moment, it's checkpoints like one friend of mine, who calls it, this is a Palestine no one speaks about. Uh, and I'm hoping that international community will speak more and more about because what, ha as the Indian policy from last year, what has happened is that as they have taken away the autonomy, but the diaspora, and they took the autonomy away as we speak, there is a communication lockdown. There's only partial, in uh, partial internet available inside Kashmir at the moment. And um, the, for nine months, uh, for six, seven months, there was constant curfew. There was no, uh, there was no communication, you didn't have any phones. So we did not know what was happening inside Kashmir as the autonomy was taken away. So at the moment, uh, there is some international uh, interest around Kashmir and we, we feel like as diaspora who can speak, uh, who have uh, the wherewithal, even though there is fear and there are, there are all sorts of persecutions that are happening. But at the same time, uh, we feel like it's, it's time that we talk about Imperial India. It's time we talk about not just post-colonial subaltern India, but we talk about the imperial heart of India that, that has derived its colonial constitutionalism from uh, what British left behind and how it has taken that infrastructure and how it has superimposed that on Kashmir. And not just Kashmir, it has other pockets of inflammation as well, but Kashmir is a separate issue. It's not just an issue of, uh, you know, rights and resources, but it's also an issue of liberation and its own right to sovereignty. I think that's where I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arthur. Um, thank you for elaborating on the integration of the army and the police and how they are one um, in the case of Kashmir and for reminding us also of the very real life consequences of the numbers that we've been talking about today um, in terms of war, military occupation, policing. Um, and again, to what's already been said, um, elaborating on the violence built and perpetuated by legal mechanisms and by um, state institutions of like, so-called democracies. Um, thank you for that intervention. Uh, now to our final speaker, um, uh, Adam Elliot Cooper, um, we tend to ask how now that we've heard about this, these different parts of the machine of war and empire and talked of its global characteristics, how do, you, how do we understand this in what's often perceived as the domestic or the local, um, especially as like uh, as as the speakers are all are all based in the global north, um, how useful is the separation of the police and military of war and policing? Um, so just to introduce Adam quickly, um, Adam Elliot Cooper is a research associate at the University of Greenwich. He received his PhD from the School of Geography and Environment. Um, at the University of Oxford in 2016. He's previously worked as a researcher in the Department of Philosophy at UCL, as a teaching fellow in the Department of Sociology, Sociology um, at the University of Warwick, and as a research associate um, in the Department at uh, as a research associate in the Department of Geography at KCL, King's College London. He sits on the board of the Monitoring Group, which is an anti-racist organization challenging state racisms um, and racial violence. Um, Adam, I'll hand over to you now. 
Well, thanks very much, and uh, very many thanks to all the organisers and everyone who put in a lot of hard work in putting this together. I really appreciate it. Um, so a lot of really important stuff has already been said. Um, I think um, linking the ways in which uh, the British Empire um, created the environment in which we are currently situated, in which um, we have this profound problem with policing and prisons um, and violence, both here on the British mainland and in Britain's former colonies. Um, so I guess I'm going to talk maybe a very a little bit about how those kinds of forms of colonial policing and colonial militarism um, made their way uh, back to the motherland, back to the British um, homeland um, in uh, the post-colonial period, and then talk about the ways in which we see that emerging, uh, not through uh, the war on terror, as Arunas talks about, or uh, the hostile environment policy, or the war on migrants, as um, Nadine has talked about, but on the war on gangs, the other racialized war that our police and prison system um, has, um, has uh, declared um, over the coming decades, and how this has uh, led to both a militarization, a further militarization of uh, policing in Britain, and further um, uh, blurred the boundaries between the military and the police in Britain, but also what demands are being made by people resisting this form of racialized policing. How can we link that resistance to racist policing and the prison system to um, a resistance to um, uh, the military um, systems that um, pervade much of the, the formerly colonized world? So although Arun mentioned um, Kenya and Malaya as key sites of um, British counterinsurgency policing, where uh, the British police and British military um, were certainly very blurred, and we saw uh, the use of things like mass surveillance, mass imprisonment, mass arrest, forced migration, um, stops, searches, um, uh, arrests, fines um, of also called suspect communities, whether they be the Kikuyu nation in Kenya or whether they be people of. Chinese heritage in Malay, um, identified as being suspects um, in these particular uh, colonial contexts or these decolonizing contexts. We really see these forms of um, colonial policing migrating to Britain by that, um, that, by that very old British colony that ended up becoming part of the United Kingdom, Ireland. So then in the north of Ireland, we begin to see very similar forms of collect collective punishment, uh, forced movement of people, mass imprisonment, stops, searches, as well as the militarisation of policing during, during many periods of uh, Irish, uh, Irish colonisation, but importantly during the, the so-called troubles um, in, um, in the, in the post-war period. And it's not until it's it's not until the urban revolts in 1981 in Britain, um, in Toxteth, in St Paul's, in uh, Brixton, in other uh, multicultural uh, cities across England, that we begin to see the uh, the colonial police in Britain's two remaining colonies or significant remaining colonies but in the 1980s, um, uh, both uh, on, uh, Ireland and and. Hong Kong begin to offer assistance to the police on the British mainland for how to deal with these uh, urban uprisings. Um, and it's, of course, Britain's uh, black populations which are the targets of this kind of policing. And so you see kind of the, um, the introduction of militarized forms of equipment, things like um, uh, riot police and the kind of armor that they have and the kind of weaponry they have, uh, the idea of baton rounds, CS spray, all of these. Um, uh, uh, tactics and weapons being used against uh, multicultural urban communities in places like Toxteth and then eventually on uh, uh, council estates like Broadwater Farm in Tottenham and elsewhere um, following these uprisings against, um, against police violence and police racism. And so we can see here how um, the empire, what some people call the empire, comes home. It comes home via Northern Ireland um, into uh, the British mainland to be used against former British colonial subjects who are now uh, making up uh, what was to become this uh, multicultural Britain. One of the other ways in which we see uh, this form of racialized policing and the militarism of uh, racist policing um, proliferating is through what David Cameron called the all-out war on gangs and gang culture, which he uh, announced following the uprisings of 2011. 
And here we see um, surveillance being used, so uh, people having their internets being surveilled in a similar way to uh, prevent um, having uh, uh, teachers and healthcare workers and youth workers being told to uh, look for signs of uh, violence or uh, gang affiliation so they could report them to the police. So we've had the police uh, kind of um, insidiously kind of infecting our public services in a similar way to we see the war on terror and the hostile environment policy. And of course, over the, between 1993 and 2019, we see the prison population in Britain almost double from around 40,000 to around 80,000. And there are a range of ways in which the prison population has doubled. Um, Tony Blair introduced over 3,000 new sort of criminal offences. Um, but the war on gangs, the war on terror, and the hostile environment policy has been a key way in which uh, public support um, has been uh, garnered for this massive expansion in the use of prisons. So many of the... Um, the arguments against this expansion of the prison system, I think are some, in some ways comparable to the arguments against the expansion of British and imperial militarism. So while we can often argue that um, uh, the invasions and occupations of Iraq and Afghanistan, the bombings of Libya, uh, the, 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 drone, the use of drones across Pakistan or uh, Somalia or, or, or other places in the world are totally, not only totally ineffective in trying to ameliorate the uh, problems which they claim they're supposed to be dealing with, but of course bring far more violence to these places. Right? They bring far more uh, suffering and death and destruction to places which are already um, engulfed in uh, profound political and social um, uh, unrest and, um, and, uh, and conflict. And I think we should understand the police and prison system in a comparable way. I think we should understand the police and prison system as bringing more violence to communities which are, which are suffering from lack of decent housing, lack of decent jobs, lack of access to education and training, lack of, lack of access to the social care that they need, lack of access to the mental health provision um, and the actual health care provision that they need, lack of access to secure documentation to live in this country. All of these things which mean that there are, there's, already, there are, there's already violence, there's already suffering, there's already conflicts, there's already premature death within these communities that are over-policed. Bringing the police to these communities doesn't help to ameliorate those problems of, um, of that, that I've already mentioned. They actually bring more violence. Right? So if we think about one of the main ways in which the police use their power, the power to stop and search. Um, the overall majority of police um, stop and searches are that they don't find anything on the individual and most of the times in which they do find something on an individual um, it's generally a small amount of cannabis and if it's not a small amount of cannabis it's um, a public order offence which basically means that the person is argued back to the stop and search which means that the police have decided that they've committed a public order offence and they're arresting them for that instead. So we see the ways in which harassment um, of no crime or small level crime is the fundamental way in which the police tend to exert their power and influence. And whilst we've seen the numbers of police proliferate enormously over the past 30 or 40 years, as I mentioned, the number of uh, the amount of powers that they have proliferate enormously over the last 30 or 40 years, uh, the, the weaponry that they have, more and more police are armed, whether it be for the war on gangs or the war on terror or the war on our borders, whether it be the use of tasers um, more often. All of these forms of power and resources means that they're able to bring more violence into the communities that they police. So what a lot of campaigners are arguing, therefore, is that we is that is that they is that they're demonstrating that this massive increase in the use of police and prisons in Britain hasn't led to any re reduction in violence or harm in any of the communities that need it most. Right? Violence and harm still remains a key issue that plagues people's lives and doesn't um, and and this 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 continual use of more police and more prisons hasn't helped to ameliorate. So what they're arguing instead is for um, better access to decent jobs and secure housing, better access to mental health provision and social care, better access to all of the kind of social and economic um, uh, resources that any human being in the world needs in order to live a healthy and safe and harm and violent free life. And in the same way as the people in, in, in various parts of the global south um, 
would, would have their problems far better ameliorate, ameliorated by access to healthcare and housing um, and, and decent jobs and autonomy and freedom within their lives. The people of, um, and that's not being helped by militarism, the people of Britain, most, most adversely affected by lack of housing and jobs and healthcare and education, and everything else, would also be far better served by, by having access to those things and not um, having those social problems being uh, locked away by our ever expanding prison and police system. Um, I'll leave it there. Thanks so much, Adam. Uh, thank you also for bringing in prisons into the conversation, which um, Lana was also going to be was also going to touch about. But thank you also for yeah bringing that that um, that important part that has been we haven't had much chance to elaborate on um, in this conversation. But thank you. Um, and just before we um, move to our fifteen minute break, I thought maybe it would be useful to hear some reflections from speakers on what everybody else has said. Um, maybe we could start from the same order. So Arun, I don't know if we could all, if, if we could maybe delay the break a bit and maybe have each speaker give maybe like a three minute max intervention on what they've heard so far. And if they have any initial reflections, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, um, I've really, um, there's a lot of connections here to, to kind of pull out and a lot of, a lot of, um, thoughts here. Um, I mean, I think for me, the, the, thing, the, the thing that I'm feeling about the conversation so far is, it's, I think it's worth just thinking about where we are in terms of, you know, right now, um, both in the United States and in the UK, you know, we have um, a mobilization going on, right? We have lots of young people out on the streets um, uh, trying to build some kind of movement to um, to address these issues, especially around policing, right? The Black Lives Matter movement, and um, what these it seems to, it seems to me what these young people are talking about is um, they're trying to grapple with this exact question of state violence that we've been talking about, and they're and they're understanding that state violence um, as as we've all been saying in different ways as something that is um, is systematic. It's not about um, you know, individual prejudices of individual officers, but it's systematic and it has um, historical continuities um, uh, in different ways in the UK and the US. Um, and so when, you know, when we look at um, people um, who are, you know, it's, it, when Adam's, Adam was talking about um, the, the, the colonial policing coming back to, to mainland Britain, um, you know, and, and that's exactly what um, people are starting to think about when they think about these statues um, and, and, and tearing down statues. It's precisely as a way people are trying to think through how, you know, how do we deal with this continuity, right? I mean, um, you know, Cecil Rhodes, uh, one of the statues we ought to be pulling down, is, is someone who exactly talks about this. You know, Cecil Rhodes talks about how um, policing, it, uh, like the... the the, the colonial policing is a way of controlling Britain's domestic working class, right? The two go hand in hand. He understood that from his point of view, right? So we need to understand that from our point of view. Um, and and it, it goes back to this question of, um, you know, we need to do a better job, I think, of focusing on who are these people who we're up against and what are, the, what are their interests? How do we describe them? How do they get their power? The security establishment, so, you know, it, one of the reasons that colonialism comes home in the way that Adam's describing is because people come home, right? It's like the people who were working in the Northern Ireland counterinsurgency campaign come home to be running the Metropolitan Police. The people who, who are responsible for mass torture and running concentration camps in Kenya come home to police Britain's black populations, right? And then retire to a nice comfortable home somewhere in the home counties, presumably while still living today, there are the victims of their torture are alive in Kenya, right? And the victims of their policies struggling in, in London, right? So, um, and, you know, same with the, um, what Nadine was talking about in relation to the, you know, 1971 Immigration Act, which no one's ever heard of anymore. Um, night, you know, as she was describing, the 1971 Immigration Act is fundamental to defining what Britain is. I mean, you know, Everyone nowadays wants to talk about British values and so forth and define it as this kind of weird abstract identity of liberal values or whatever. But the 1971 Immigration Act 
resegregates Britishness, right? At a time when the United States, at least formally, is desegregation, right? It is, is attempting to racially desegregate, in its, at least on the legislative level, the UK is, is resegregating Britishness and saying, here is where white people are and here is where black people are, and we're going to keep them separate, right? Um, we don't have a, a sense of that in our sense of what Britain is. Um, you know, and so with the Black Lives Matter movement right now in the UK, you know, one of the responses that you often get is, oh, well, it's really an American thing, right? And this is, um, you, know, you know, in terms of thinking about prisons, right? As Adam says, we have doubled the prison population in Britain, right? That's, mass incarceration is not solely an American thing. The disproportionality of British black people in prisons is, is greater than the US uh, prison system in the UK, right? So there are more black people in US prisons than in UK prisons, but the disproportionality is greater in the UK, right? So we can't be complacent in the UK. Um, plus what, what these movements are about is about precisely understanding the global connections, not thinking within these national borders, but understanding the global, the global connections because um, the, there are global connections in the power structures, right? It is true, you know, whatever uh, silencing has been attempted within the Labour Party on this issue, it is simply a fact that police forces in Britain and the United States are trained by Israel in how to deploy violence. Um, it shouldn't be a sacking offence to say that um, in the Labour Party um, because there is a global policing infrastructure and Israel is at the centre of it, right? So unless, unless we can talk about that, we are doing not only a disservice to the Palestinians, but also to uh, anyone who's a racialized victim of policing in Britain and the United States, right? Because we have to understand these, these global connections. Um, I'll stop there. Thanks, Nadine. Do you, do you have anything that you'd like to share with us? Aaron's done a really good job of kind of bringing everyone's contributions together. Um, yeah, so I, I don't I don't have anything immediately pressing except to say that I think that um, yeah everybody everybody kind of brought the questions of war, policing, bordering, and empire together. I think in a really clear way. I'm I'm really interested to to know what people listening um, have heard about. Um, people listening um, think think about what what was said. Um, I I I also was struck. Of course, we're missing our speaker on on Palestine and. I was struck by what Atha said when she said that Kashmir is is um, a, a Palestine that no one speaks about, and that really struck me as being a, a powerful statement. Also, because I think Palestine is a Palestine that that no one speaks about, um, or is afraid to speak about, because of a lot of the kinds of um, surveillance and um, kind of um, attacks and immediate sort of um, accusations of anti-Semitism, etc. Um, when anyone tries to say anything about Palestine, and I think particularly in this moment when um, Israel is annexing um, uh, uh, parts of Palestine illegally, etc., and, uh, and we're facing this, you know, almost total silencing and backlash, and you know, um, people being sacked from their positions, people being totally attacked in the media when anyone says anything i feel like palestine is also is also a place that nobody can speak about and and it just kind of showing that sort of level of um the way in which policing is not just something that is done to us but that we do to ourselves um out of fear um out of um, self-censoring um because of you know real real concerns about you know that range from material losses like job losses to um to just a, a fear of being constructed in a particular way and having to face kind of a public outcry. And we've seen a lot of, you know, people ranging scholars, activists, politicians, et cetera, for saying things about Palestine and, and you know, suffering quite significant material losses. And so I think I'd like to think a bit more about the sort of um, psychic realities that are produced by the, 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 the policing and the surveillance that we're subjected to every day and how you know, we can do an event like this, but actually are there things that we are afraid to say? Are there, is there action that we're afraid to take? And, you know, it's something that I, that I struggle with a lot. And, and I really, so I really appreciate after the way you, um, yeah, spoke about that, you know, the not speaking, um, sort of um, diminishing a, a place, a people's, and, and how we're somehow complicit in that. I certainly feel um, constantly complicit or unsure about whether I'm saying enough or, or whether there's something more that can be said in a way that will be heard and not be constructed as something that it that it's not intended as being. Thanks.
Thanks, Nadine. Fatah, do you, I, I don't know if you want to uh, respond directly to Nadine or maybe share some thoughts on um, what all the speakers have said. You're on mute. So it was a decade back that a friend of mine uh, mentioned this, uh, that, that Kashmir is a Palestine that no one talks about. And we have been thinking about Palestine and Kashmir for the longest time now, because if, if uh, you know, Kashmir has been a place where uh, even in, uh, during the uh, few years back, whenever something happens in Gaza or something happens in Palestine, Kashmiris take out demonstrations, despite the kind of authoritarianism they live under. And I think in 2016 or 2017, a young boy was killed after they took out a demonstration supporting Palestine and uh, uh, you know, protesting uh, Israel's bombing of Gaza. Uh, and, and thinking about Kashmir and Palestine together, I think what happens, uh, why in a, in, in a critical Kashmir scholarship, recently I co-edited a, a journal, Identities uh, Special Issue, which was, which is kind of comparing Kashmir and Palestine, bringing scholars together. And uh, it's kind of a start to thinking about both the occupations. And I see one of the questions here, which was talking about that Kashmir is not a dispute on the United Nations list, but Kashmir and Palestine are the one, two oldest disputes, you know, the first disputes on the list of United Nations, uh, list of agenda, so to speak. It was at that time called the Kashmir Questions, and there are about 11 resolutions that have been passed on Kashmir till the late 1960s before Cold War set in and things started changing geopolitically. Um, so, uh, so, so to, to think that, of course, Palestine is not talked about in the same manner because we see what is happening to scholars and activists, and we have seen uh, what happened to uh, Stephen Salaita. And now we are seeing the same thing that is being leveled against Kashmiri scholar activists. Uh, there's, a, there's a diasporic organization called Stand with Kashmir. Uh, very recently, the Islamist Watch, they published the, a long expose, what they call an expose against that, that organization. And my work was mentioned as well, and some other scholars as well. So we see it's kind of like they're bringing it at parallel, thinking about this is not, these are not resistances, but these are terrorisms that the world is uh, supposed to fight against. And here are people who are sitting in the West and trying to speak for these uh, disputes. Uh, so, and I really like the idea of thinking about global connections because I think we are not at liberty to kind of like look at. Uh, look at Kashmir just as Kashmir, but having these larger linkages and thinking about India and thinking about India's relationship to Israel, thinking about India's relationship to UK at the present moment, and thinking about its emerging and its very strong relationship with the US at the moment. And, 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 and in that paradigm, looking at what Kashmir is, so keeping in mind the historicity, keeping in mind the emerging contemporary relationships, I think that's the only way we can narrativize these uh, occupations and we can narrativize the policing that is happening, the militarization that is happening. And not only what's happening in Kashmir, but at the moment, if you look at the Muslim population within India, uh, early on, they used to think about the Muslim populations in India and thinking about its relationship with Israel. But now it's come to a moment where they don't, they don't really care about the Muslim populations because they are on the verge of being made second class citizens. Uh, institutionally and legally. Uh, now the uh, relationship has been changing for the past, um, I, I would say, one decade and even, uh, more so after Modi comes in. So I think, I, I think con conversations like this and having, you know, pegging all of these in this big paradigm that we are putting together, especially thinking about global co co connections. So I, I think that's very, very important. And for Kashmiris, Palestine has been a beacon because for the longest time, Kashmir has been seen as a terrorism issue, especially since 2001. And when people think about Palestine and when they say pa Kashmir is a Palestine that no one talks about, it's meant as, as drawing this parallel so that it becomes a shorthand that we too are a resistance. Uh, because you know, if you think about India, India for the longest time was a supporter of uh, Palestinian cause. And even now uh, they think that they are supporters of pal Palestinian cause, even with the kind of relationships that have been emerging with Israel. And it's not a new thing. Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, one of the first prime ministers of India, he actually established a relationship during the Indo-Sino war 
1962 itself. So it's, it's nothing new is happening in India. It, it was camouflaged better. So I feel like just, just kind of like meditating on global connections between what we are talking about, thinking about militarization of police, thinking about occupations and laws that have been drawn from colonial um, situations, especially the British colonial, what they left behind. I think that gives a lot of context to Kashmir and that helps us uh, create these solidarities, which are very, very important. Thanks, Arthur. Um, and finally, before we move to our break, Adam, I don't know if you have any reflections you'd like to share. Um, I'm sure everyone's probably gasping for a break. It's quite been quite an intense, um, but really fascinating um, uh, hour or so, hour. But um, I, yeah, I, I, th I guess I just want to reiterate, I think, and I think everyone's kind of made this point a bit, that um, making those connections between policing and militarism is not two separate things, but things that are intricately bound, not just in the colonies and former colonies, but now um, in our, in our multi-ethnic um, uh, centers of empire and um, is fundamental for making sure that we have those links of solidarity that see the relationship between capitalism and imperialism, see the relationship um, uh, between uh, state violence domestically and state violence internationally and ensure that we can strengthen um, those struggles by making these kinds of connections through these, um, these important conversations. Thanks so much, Adam. Um, so now we're just going to have a 15 minute break. So um, we'll come back at um, 5.50 sharp, that's British summer time. Um, uh, and yeah, we'll have two rounds of um, talking about broad issues um, on violence and on resistance. Um, feel free to continue um, discussing things in the chat, um, and, but also feel free to go get a a drink, have a stretch. Um, please stay on the call though, so then we don't have to readmit you onto the call. Um, and we'll hopefully see you in 15 minutes. Thanks. <laughs>
Great. Um, I'm not sure if the rest of the speakers are with us, but maybe we should start in a minute or so. I'll just wait for them to put their videos on. Um, so maybe just whilst we wait for Arun and Adam to join, if they're um, not already with us, um, just a reminder, everyone, that um, before we start these two rounds of conversations um, between speakers, uh, that there's a chat box um, for people to engage in conversation, share thoughts and questions. You can also tweet about the session using the hashtag War and Policing or tweet us, CAT UK, uh, CAT UK so that's C-A-A-T in caps, UK in small letters, or CAT Uni, C-A-A-T in caps, Unis, U-N-I-S in small letters. Um, a reminder also that this is part of the session, this is part, this part of the session is for, this first session is for setting foundations and painting a big picture so that the second se session, which we'll hopefully email you about, will, will be much more interactive um, and it'll include and hopefully be structured around your contributions, your questions, your interventions and um, that we'll collect from today's conversation in the chat box um, and through the feedback form which we'll share with you in the chat box um, and we already have done um, and we'll share again um, at the end um, but a reminder also if you want to pose a question within the chat box just that to be taken to that second session um, do so with the word question in caps at the beginning and add a plus sign if you'd like your name to be attributed to that question if it's um, taken on in the second session um, okay are we all back on I'm not sure if um, Adam and Arun, uh, Adam's, Arun's here, Adam's here, great, fab. Okay, so um, we're running a bit short on time, um, so maybe uh, we can stick to five minute max from speakers, if that's okay, I'm sorry, um, for uh, interventions and reflections. But the first thing I thought we could discuss, um, and the, thing, the first thing I thought we could pose to our speakers is something that we've, uh, has been touched on, uh, on um, by all of you, but maybe something that we could expand on and that's really on the topic of violence and understanding what violence is and how it operates within the frameworks and specific apparatus that we've been talking about um, so often violence spe specifically within um, anti-arms trade organizing has been sometimes attributed and limited to um, that the yeah uh, violence only being delivered at the at the end of the gun um, but how do we expand that notion of violence and how do we maybe um, expand it so we can take into consideration the very foundations that we've been talking to uh, 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 the, yeah sorry the very, the very foundation that we've been talking about today but also the violence that this arms trade um, perpetuates um, so maybe we can start in the opposite order so maybe Adam would you be okay to start, start us off um. Yeah, I guess I, I guess it's useful for us to think about um, uh, violence. Like, I guess as a, in the same way as we think about like policing in the military as as, as a continuum of violence, I think we should th also think about the violence of militarism as one form of many types of violence employed by by capitalism and by imperialism. So whether it be the violence of of, of exploitation and extraction, the violence of environmental degradation, these different forms of violence that which cause harm and suffering and and premature death um, to the lives of uh, people in the global south or uh, working class peoples in the global north. I think it should be under understood as not, so, as not, you know, there's some military politics over here and some economic politics over there, right? We have to understand them as being um, fundamentally linked and, and the, the way in which, one of the ways in which workers or surplus labor is, is disciplined by capitalism is through that militarism, right? The militarism, whether it be the militarism of our prison or police system or the militarism um, of, uh, 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 that we see from um, the occupations of Kashmir and Palestine um, and elsewhere. And so I think, I think understanding violence in that, in that broader sense is fundamentally important, not only for uh, identifying the problems we face, but of course, building links of solidarity between our different struggles. Great, thank you. That was sure um Arthur um would you like to do, maybe contribute on this question as well too sorry sorry you're on mute oh sorry uh, can you repeat the question okay. um so it's it's more of like posing a yeah a, a question or maybe an expansion on the issue of violence um and how we've talked about it today um uh, particularly particularly moving away from 
um, violence, how, how we've sometimes understood it as being only delivered um, at the end of a gun, but rather how do we understand um, empire building through war, police, militarism, and prisons, and borders, um, in, in building violent structures and also um, depending on them uh, to basically operate? Uh, it's a very interesting question in terms of Kashmir, where, uh, you know, since its very inception from 1947 onwards, I, I mean, when India presents Kashmir to the rest of the world, especially after Cold War set in, it's always presented as something that has been already assimilated and something that people have kind of like the word integration seems like such a peaceful word. Uh, I mean, not a peaceful word, but it seems like a normal kind of a word for Kashmiris. Integration means is is a very uh, violent word because uh, India, for the last seventy two years, has been threatening that it's going to integrate Kashmir. Which it, last year, what it did was, it actually said that it's been completely integrated after uh, August fifth, twenty nineteen. And what's really interesting when we think about Kashmir situation, and we like to think about. Uh, in India kind of like looking at this piece of land or this region and trying to assimilate and trying to annex it to itself. But what we also, what is also invisibilized is the fact that what does India want Kashmir for? Is it just the prestige of having this region? Is it just, uh, or are there resources involved? And I think that's one of the big part of what India needs Kashmir for, because there are some major rivers that are passing through Kashmir. Uh, there is lots of resources. And what happened after August 5th recently, that when the autonomy was taken away, it was August 5th the autonomy was taken away. And within 15 days, uh, thinking about Kashmir being in communication lockdown, thinking about Kashmir being re-annexed and thinking about this region completely disappearing from the world communication radar, uh, there was mechanism put into place where Forest Advisory Council, which earlier was an autonomous body that would look at uh, deforestation, that would look at roads that were being laid down, and they would they would kind of like have this accountability. They wouldn't, they wouldn't allow uh, India to come in and lay down roads, especially roads around the uh, frontiers. But within, uh, I, I think within uh, one, one month, they, or less than one month, they cleared more than 200 projects. And most of them had to be, had to do with laying down roads in the frontiers. Now, when I use the word frontiers, I'm not using the word border because there's no international border between the two Kashmirs at the moment. And that's another misnomer that gets perpetuated, especially in the international uh, media when, and uh, be, because India really invests in thinking about a border inside two Kashmirs, which is not the, which is not the reality. There is a line of control between the two Kashmirs, and which is why when uh, in normal parlance, we kind of like to uh, refer to it as, uh, as a frontier, not a border. So what it actually began doing right after that was looking at all these resources and laying down the roads and also massive deforestation and thinking about this is, this is a, this is this is a geographically very small region and you have 8 million people then you have 700,000 troops inside a region thinking about massive environmental degradation that's already happening uh, there was a flood in uh, 2014 that occurred inside Kashmir and most of it was man-made most of the flood like it, it's a Kashmir at the moment because it's a valley it acts like a soup bowl the moment there's a little rain it gets inundated and there is massive flooding and inundation and 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 because you have so you have this is one of the highest militarized zones and you have so much army inside and the army is also occupying civilian areas and the ar army has also encroached and as we are speaking, because they changed the domicile law, now the army is outright going and are saying that it's going to buy land inside Kashmir. And thinking about the infrastructures that they will put in place and thinking about the environmental degradation and also the kind of resource looting, the neoliberal loot that plunder that India has already put into motion in the last one years. And that has been going on for the last 72 years, but now it's on steroids because settler colonialism is not just looming, it's a reality. So I feel, uh, I, I, I concur with Adam thinking about uh, environmental degradation, thinking about you know climate change, uh, Kashmir is, is is at the forefront of all of those issues. And I feel like these conversations are important for us to kind of pinpoint what can happen. And thinking about the fact that it's a nuclear flashpoint, 
and thinking about what, what can happen if this region really, really goes awry between the two countries and that's happening at the moment. And now China is a major player on the other side. And ever since the autonomy went away, uh, China has been vocal, especially at the United Nations level, although it might not have uh, produced any tangible results at the United uh, Nations Security Council level, but they did have an informal meeting. And now you have a, you have a face off between India and China happening because China is a major stakeholder in one of the areas, especially the, which we see as a no man's land, but it's a research rich, it's a, it's a resource rich region. And, and thinking about the entire Kashmir with its water resources, with its mineral resources, with the potential for tourism, this is a gold mine. This is a real estate gold mine for India. And what India is doing, the other thread of it is the pilgrimage tourism that has been increasing. And, and the environmental degradation that has been linked, uh, that, that, that is kind of a fallout and a consequence of that uh, pilgrimage tourism, which was in thousands some years back, but now is in lakhs, which was only 15 or 20 days, but now is uh, being stretched to six months. So these are uh, pilgrims from India that kind of come into Kashmir and then you, they are in Himalayas and thinking about, uh, and, and the most interesting part is that the cave which they um, go to was managed by Muslims in the past. And now because the pilgrim, pilgrims are, it, they come in droves and in lakhs, that the stalactite there, it, uh, it, it, it melts. Now they ha actually have to put an AC in the Himalayas so that the stalactite does not melt. And that kind of manifests the, the different, uh, the, the, the different devastations that have been put into motion by Indian occupation. Thank you again, Arthur. Um, yeah, to, thank you so much for that powerful contribution. And maybe to take take a step back and and paint the go go in the opposite way and and paint paint the obvious. Um, something that we haven't really talked about today is um, environmental degradation. So thank you for um, bringing that up, but also the revolving door. So Adam talked a lot. Uh, sorry, Arun talked a lot at the beginning. I think about um, people and um, positions of power uh, um, and how. How, how power operates, um, but something that maybe for part two of the series is thinking about uh, people in specific industries that may seem very unrelated to war and militarism being in those um, th those um, military industries and police uh, police industries and board industries. So to take the example of like, for example, British arms companies with chairmen and CEOs being uh, on, uh, uh, the board of directors for big oil companies as well, um, or uh, yeah, big companies related to infrastructure in, in, in the global south. Um, Nadine, I don't know if you have anything that you'd like to contribute on this topic. Um, yes, so I mean, I, I want to come back, I think, to um, something that Aaron said, um, which struck me because it's something I've been thinking about um, lately, but he said that when talking about surplus populations and refugee camps that um you know we're putting people away um so that we don't need to 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 think about what we've done or, or to think about them and i suppose when adam says that we need to think about violence of um of militarism as one form of racial state violence and of course Atha very helpfully kind of set out some other forms including environmental harm and um it's something that I'm that I'm interested in because I suppose when we're thinking about the arms trade, it's often framed fundamentally as a question of divestment um, um, from companies, um, industries, and and a kind of struggle that can be taken to the workplace in terms of that kind of divestment. And I suppose I just want to maybe think about divestment a bit more broadly as also being about um, our own kind of psychic realities or understandings around what it means to be complicit in this sort of hiding of people away and i suppose you know hiding people away is a kind of retreat from what we're afraid of or, or, or the kind of acceptance we have of who is threatening or who is dangerous to us our families our children etc and you know i think about divestment from 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 forms of structural violence or, or rather institutions that perpetuate structural violence not just in a financial sense but also you know things like private schools um independent schools this this idea that you know 
people buy into segregation as a form of protecting themselves and really or or, or even um you know a retreat from from inner cities or moving to the suburbs as this kind of flight from what is considered to be a threat and what is considered to be dangerous and and that's a kind of complicity it's a kind of um uh sort of silent subscription to to what what are ultimately um very violent institutions and and structures and it, and it makes me think of um this quote from 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 Baldwin where he says you know you cannot lynch me and keep me in ghettos without becoming something monstrous yourselves and I suppose he he goes on to say that that that, that gives us an advantage because you know you know the white person doesn't have to look at me but I have to look at you and I know what you're about and and and, and but he's sort of calling to people who might be complicit in these structures to kind of face that complicity and to um, to, to look at what they've become um, as a result of kind of participating in in these structures. And so I suppose what I'm trying to do is saying is say that it is about structures, but I think that it's also sometimes helpful to when we're thinking about divestment to to think about our own ways of, of being complicit and, and not divesting um, and sort of shielding our kind of understandings of our psyches and, and realities and sort of just 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 talking about about the structural without kind of seeing how actually um, our retreat, our retreats from, from, from how we're retreating from ourselves when we when we um, when we don't sort of confront or understand the, the notion of divesting and complicity as kind of more broad than just you know divesting our workplaces from investment in arms on the arms trade, for example. Thank you, Nadine. Yeah, I think that's super important. And again, given that a lot of us are um, yeah based in the global north and and trying to address that complicity. Um, uh, Arun, I don't know if you have uh, some thoughts on this before we move on to the second uh, broad question or issue. Uh, let, let me just quickly um, kind of, I, I mean, I think what Nadine was just saying is worth, is worth picking up on and, and um, adding to a little. Um, uh, I mean, I think it's a crucial point about the, the sort of the psychology of how we all get wrapped up in um in these i mean you can call i mean you can call it in, in a slightly academic way kind of these, these kind of discourses of security or whatever you want to call them the idea that our comfort to the extent that we have some our our wealth to the extent that we have some in in a country like britain um is dependent on shielding ourselves off from a whole series of threats that are constantly presented to us, whether it's the terrorist or the migrant or the gang, right? And 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 that's how you know, I think that's how violence has become so central to um, to the way we imagine ourselves, right? The idea that there are all these violent threats out there waiting to um, to take away this quite precarious sense of of security that we that we cling on to. Um, and and the thing you know the thing that the peace movement has been um you know the peace i think the peace movement has done this this work for some time now right of talking about um when we talk about peace um we it's not sufficient to think of peace as the absence of war right we need to think about peace in terms of a broader sense of um a, a society of mutual um, a, a society of, of social justice bound up through our relationships with each other, being social relationships that are based on healthy mutual dependency, right? We, security comes from relationships. It doesn't come from cutting oneself off from others. It comes from having a productive and healthy relationship with others, right? So, you know, tr I mean, that's, that's what uh, Martin Luther King means when he says, you know, um, genuine peace is is um, not the absence of violence, but the presence of justice, right? And he goes on to talk about, you know, in order to achieve that, um, you know, by the late 60s, he's saying not only do we need to um, uh, tackle racism in the United States, but we also need to end wars like the Vietnam War, but we also need to, to end um, societies based on the making of profit, right? He's talking about all three at that point. And he's saying he no longer um, can go to young people in the United States and tell them not to use violent means to achieve their goals. Um, we can't do that without hypocrisy while the government, um, as he puts it, the US government is still the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. Um, and, and so he's very clearly seeing these interconnections that we've been trying to talk about um, between 
from the domestic and the, and the global um, between racism at home and empire abroad. Um, and, he's, and he's come to that through the peace movement, right, which I think is, is um, important. And um, yeah, I think I th so in terms of what that means in terms of for us as people trying to think about these issues and, and move on these issues, um, you know, we need to, we do need to have a vision of what it would mean for us to, um, to live differently, right? To not live in this, in this kind of um, way of um, cutting ourselves off um, in, in more and more frightening enclaves. Um, and because in the end, I mean, if, if this pandemic demonstrates anything and if the climate change uh, catastrophe we're, we're you know, already living through demonstrates anything is that, that that way of securing ourselves doesn't work. Thanks, Aaron. Um, maybe to touch on that a little, or maybe expand on it, um, it, we can move on to the second uh, issue or question I want to pose, um, which is on, on resistance. So we've talked a lot um, today about the very bleak picture um, of all of this um, apparatus working, working together in the building and, uh, and, uh, and upholding of empire. Um, but I think it would be also nice to so, so now we've, we've seen how these monsters collaborate, right? How we can build a, an alternative, imagine an alternative and build it, and also how we can um, work collaboratively in, in uh, the organizing that we do, whether that's um, on uh, abolitionist organizing on prisons or police or anti-arms trade organizing, how we can come together, but also how we can work transnationally um, uh, in this move, like, to end these uh, oppressions and structures that are so interlinked and that, that, that you also eloquently um, elaborated on. Um, maybe we could start with Adam again and go in reverse order, is that okay? Um, uh, hmm. <laughs> I guess it's a difficult one, but yeah, I, I'm trying to think of some to say something that I haven't kind of already said already a little bit. Um, but I think. Do you want us to, to? Shall we start with another speaker who has a few things, and then maybe you can come back? Would that be okay? I might need a minute just to think of one. Yeah. Does anyone fancy kicking that question off? <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> Okay, Adam, you have to. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, could you maybe just say, say the question again? Let me just. Thank you. Maybe we want to say that. Okay, um, I was just saying, so we've sorry. talked a lot about how these industries collaborate and work collectively. Um, how do we build the alternative to that? How do we um, work collaboratively um, in the organizing that we do, but also um, think about a transnational organizing? Um, which is sometimes quite absent um, in the specific organising that we do. Um, so I guess we have to, um, on the one on the one hand, push against the kind of liberal, often state-sanctioned um, individualism um, that could often uh, be presented to us as anti-racism or presented to us as radical politics. The idea that you know racism is more about um, uh, prejudice or uh, individual privileges um, or, or uh, individual slights um, rather than it being something which is integral to the reproduction of capitalism rather than something which is integral to the way in which the state reproduces its power um, and, and is fundamentally linked with, with imperialism. I think that's something that's fundamentally important and I think the state is constantly attempting to co-opt radical struggles to turn um, the, the, the oppressions that are faced around the world um, into something which can be yeah, individualized and, and therefore depoliticized effectively um, and not link to the materiality of, of capitalism. Um, and so I think that's fundamentally important. Um, but I think it's also really vital that we continue to build on the existing struggles that have, that have identified the links between um, wanting to abolish the police and prison system, but also wanting to abolish um, militarism. And the idea that imagining a world where the military, where military infrastructures are no longer necessary has to be linked to imagining a world in which prisons and police are no longer necessary. 
and both of those radical imaginaries require us to dismantle capitalism, they require us to defeat imperialism, they require us to do this, this, this economic work in order to get to this world in which these forms of state violence um, are no longer uh, with us. Thank you. Um, Arthur, um, would you like to um, share some reflections on the question mm -hmm. posed as well? Mm -hmm. You know, thinking about uh, how these industries collaborate and organize and how we can kind of gather transnational strength in these the solidarities, I, I have a couple of things to say. So first and foremost, we also have to think about uh, India, even though in its post-colonial situation, uh, the way it was left behind by the British and the way it's a uh, neo-colonial, new imperial project that it has taken up. If we look at 1991, when the Indian uh, economy uh, liberalized, that also coincides with um, the uh, Kashmiri armed struggle uh, starting in 1989 and then AFSPA being impl implemented in 1991 itself. The, the new economic uh, policy that uh, India, impo India implemented in 1991, it also coincided with the BJP, the current Hindu, uh, Hindutva, uh, Hindu supremacist right-wing government. Uh, they took out uh, a protest, uh, not a protest, a demonstration that was like a long kind of, it was an all India demonstration, uh, all India, sort of like a, uh, uh, it was called the Rath Yatra, but it was like the Shariat that they had uh, made. And you had all these uh, ruling politicians, uh, not ruling, the politicians from the B uh, Bharatiya Janata Party, they were all on it and they were kind of like uh, traveling across India. And wherever they were traveling, they were leaving a little bit of a pogrom in their wake, uh, the, the communal clashes between Muslims and Hindus. So these are, these are forces kind of collating in the early 1990s. And the reason I kind of uh, bring this up is we also have to think about uh, India itself being part of this um, neo-colonial project but it, where it is being driven and where it is driving its own agenda as well. And thinking about the Western masculine patriarchal project of development, if last year when India was trying to sell Kashmir's um, taking away its autonomy, it was saying that it's doing for the development of Kashmir, it's going to develop its resources and a lot of international uh, communities bought that argument. And, and kind of like thinking about that, we do have to unveil the beast uh, of this neoliberal uh, colonial mentality, the, 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 the sort of like thinking about these systems of colonization and also thinking about how India uh, is, it, it ha the rubric that is India is also a part of that. And now uh, when the development paradigm that India put into place and it's kind of selling, and has also like part of it is settler colonialism as well that is being unfolded in Kashmir at the moment. And it's not just bringing people in, but it's also just bringing corporates in. I don't know whether they're going to come in droves or how that's going to happen because it's also a disputed area where there's a lot of violence. So I don't know how that investment is going to come in, but we do have to think about India in itself as part of the Western masculine project. A sort of patriarchal project where development is at the core of uh, India being developed under a neo-colonial, uh, neoliberal agenda as well. So how much liberty does it have to not do what it is doing at the moment? And whose bidding is it doing? So I think that's also an important question to consider. Uh, not that I'm being, uh, not that I'm kind of cutting India any slack, but but that, that's very important to see that, that the, the kind of cy cycle, the vicious cycle that has been uh, put into play and now that it's also eating its own, if we see through the, 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 the frontiers of India and the way it's uh, attacking its own masses inside, uh, that's, that's something to consider as well. And thinking about like, how can we get strong? I feel like uh, partly to even think about this question, uh, I'm, I'm working on a paper. I was part of several conversations where we are thinking about these questions and these questions are posed to us. I, I think, uh, I mean, there is, there is a moment of reflection. There is a moment of just, just thinking about like, how can this evolve? I, I think part of that silence that, that occurs at the moment when this question is asked is also the juncture that we are on because now we have started to think and link all of these things together and think about this as a global coloniality uh, as part of that project. And I think that's very important that we have to name the beast and then we have to shame the beast. And I think uh, part of the, the conversation that we're having um, as it kind of continues, we are unveiling, we are naming and shaming the beast, and that's very important. 
And I'm really happy that Kashmir is part of these conversations. 15 years back when I was talking about Kashmir at different places, people couldn't make sense of it. Even some Palestinian scholars, so to speak, uh, they, they thought that because uh, Palestine and Kashmir, they ha have a connection. They, they didn't see Kashmir in the same way. And I'm like, Kashmir is an occupation. They're the first oldest two disputes on the United Nations agenda. And some, I'm not saying all Kashmiri scholars, uh, all Palestinian scholars, some of the scholars that I was meeting initially, uh, and it's, it's taken us 15 long years to say that Kashmir is an occupation, it is a problem, it is a dispute, and there's still a lot of uh, obfuscation around the, uh, around the issue. So I think, uh, so my only thing, my, my only, uh, not discomfort, but my only, uh, I, I only wonder, like, how can we get as strong as the states? I'm not saying that we are powerless. I think what we have seen Kashmiri diaspora do in the last nine months uh, is what we could not achieve for the last 15 months, uh, 15 years. Uh, so I see that strength. I, I see that strength in transnational solidarities and creating solidarities across continents, across states in the US, across um, you know, different marginalized communities. I, I see that what we have been able to achieve so far, and even this conversation for that matter. But at the same time, like how can we systemically uh, face these states, which have all the money, which have all the power, which have these, which are so institutionalized that we, we will take a long time to get to that point, even, but we don't want to get to that point the way they are. But, but how do we strengthen ourselves and, uh, and uh, sort of like, you know, build on the resources that we have? Thank, Thank you. you so much. Um, Nadine, would you like to add anything to this contribution? Yeah, just briefly. So um, I think I suppose the only thing I want to say is that if you know if we're understanding things like war and policing and um, empire together and connecting these dots and making these transnational connections and you know making sure we're working towards an anti-imperialist internationalist understanding of this kind of violence and one that is sensitive to historical context, um, I think we also have to apply. This sort of, you know, and since this question about resistance, I think we have to apply the same analysis and understanding to, you know, the resistance movements that we're seeing, for example, Black Lives Matter um, uprisings that we're seeing are also part of a long history of, um, uh, of um, anti-colonial uprisings, rather than being a kind of um, new or, or, or um, you know, something that can be just understood now and solved with a few um, legal changes or, or um, hashtags or, um, kind of um, a sort of fleeting moment, but like really part of this like long history of resistance. And I think then when we understand it in that way, um, and and we we that also brings us back to making the anti-imperialist internationalist points because then we understand things like roads must fall and the Colston statue kind of direct actions as actually you know having like Rosemont all started in South Africa and so we kind of can really make those like links in relation to resistance which we sometimes forget as well when we get sort of caught up in the local um but I also wanted to just say that we also can't can't forget the local kind of things that we need to do to defend people who are protesting and who are placing themselves kind of in the way of or, or like in front of that of that of not just racist policing sort of on the street but also the state's um um criminal process of criminalizing protesters through charging them through prosecuting them through um incarcerating them um and of course we've seen this with the with the riots here in in 2011 with the 24-hour courts with people being prosecuted we've seen now you know the kind of way in which the officials are you know, starting official statue kind of um, reviews of like which one should come down. Meanwhile, kind of asking people to identify protesters so that they can be kind of prosecuted and face the full force of the law, etc. And I think that we need to be really careful that whilst we're being um, kind of radical in our understandings and 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 sort of embracing that sweeping kind of global connections, that we also focus on defending people who are kind of like up against it at a local level. Um, by making sure that we're doing things like court support and, and you know of course like Adam could, could talk about this with what, the, what they're doing the monitoring group and, and that sort of thing but I think that we've sometimes um, maybe failed people as we as I think that we did in the riots when people were imprisoned in the way that we were they were and, and kind of um, subject to 24-hour court and like this um, fast justice without without kind of kind of really being defended as being um, as having participated in what is a long history of anti-colonial um, uprisings um, 
rather than some kind of um, you know Ill illegitimate um, uh, criminal crim criminal activity. So yeah, I just think it's about thinking about what we need to be doing locally on sort of an urgent um, uh, uh, immediate defense um, work alongside um, making sure that we're having these kinds of broader political discussions that then kind of help feed into strategy. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, maybe that's also something that we can take onto the second session and looking at the like the local and the practical and um, the, the immediate things that we can do. Um, Aaron, uh, last but definitely not least, um, would you like to contribute on this issue? Well, maybe I'll just say some things that maybe I would um, offer as, as things to think about for people specifically involved in work around the arms trade, right, in terms of some, some ideas on what can be done. So, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, when, when you're involved in, a, in activism on a particular issue, um, you know, it's obviously easy to, to find all kinds of connections that broaden out that issue to all kinds of other issues and it can feel overwhelming and it can get burgeoned into this huge big thing and before you know it you're trying to imagine how you know this thing that seemed very focused and narrow to one particular issue now is about how do we end racism and and, and racist policing and, and imperialism and so forth right and so actually that's not the best like all of that's important for a, a kind of understanding um, but in terms of in terms of going forward in, in practical activism, that's that's it's not really about that. So what you know, what I've um, what I've written down is 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 three points that um, I would, I can suggest as as things to think about to sort of what arms trade activism might change or adapt or adjust to, to to take on board this conversation. Right. So the first thing would be um, uh, do no harm. Right. So so the arm, you know, what you part of um, what this conversation um, uh, should make us aware of is um, that sometimes activism in one area can have negative consequences for um, movements and, and issues in other areas. Right. We don't want to be in a situation where um, activism on arms trade um, uh, uh, in a submerged way. Um, trades on on certain racist ideas, right? Like there is a there is a temptation sometimes to take advantage in, in you know in, in campaigns that you try, when you're trying to get mainstream coverage for your campaign in a country like the United Kingdom, you know there's always a temptation, conscious or unconscious, to say, um, isn't Saudi Arabia a barbaric country? Why should we be trading with it, right? Um, providing providing this barbaric country with um, with, with this capacity from our decent, tolerant, liberal country to, to inflict violence, right? And if, you, if you are doing that, ask yourself, well, you know, the, 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 the country that buys the most arms from the United Kingdom is the United States, right? So if you were just thinking in terms of like, where would you prioritize your arms, arms trade work if it was just about reducing violence, you would start with the United States. The United States is, is carrying out um, mass violence around the world. Um, with British made weapons, right? Like BAE system sells more weapons to the United States than it does to Saudi Arabia, right? So, you know, ask yourself why along, um, obviously Saudi Arabia is an oppressive regime, but I'm fully in favor of anything we can do to challenge that regime. Um, but it's the terms on which we do it and what do we not see and what do we exclude in the way we go about it, right? So the first thing is do no harm to other issues and, and campaigns, particularly around racism. Second thing is recognize other struggles. And not just recognize those struggles, but recognize the knowledge that those struggles generate within them, right? So, um, you know, the issue of, of military violence is an issue that communities all around the world are dealing with and have been dealing with for centuries and have their, built up their own histories and their own traditions and their own ways of thinking and insights that are not um, uh, given enough um, influence and not, and not listened to enough and not allowed to shape the conversation um, in a country like the United Kingdom enough, right? So there's a, there's a point about recognition. And then the final third thing is, is think about where are the points of overlap of shared struggles. So it's not that the, you know, the activists around the arms trade are going to um, find some way to take on imperialism, but there are going to be points where the, the, the work around the arms trade is going to overlap with other people who are doing that kind of work and there'll be points of overlap that can 
be a, a, a you know something where a kind of shared struggle can can be developed um and so you know i think of in my own um uh involvement in, in these issues a little i think of um you know going back away uh, way back now but campaigns that we that were um organized around shell right in the 1990s now um you know one of the things when we think about the world in terms of these global structures of power intertwined across different parts of the world but also intertwined across different um you know from st between the states and economies and different kinds of agency and institution that kind of structure of power creates all kinds of opportunities for these overlapping struggles right so so you know in the case of shell you had um people involved in 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 those campaigns who were campaigners against corporate power right and shell was a corporation you had people who were campaigners against the environmental damage that were um caused by fossil fuels right you also had um refugees in the united kingdom from countries like Nigeria that had been forced to leave their homes because of the um, violence and environmental damage that a company like Shell was perpetrating in a country like Nigeria, right? Um, and then you, um, outside the UK, you had struggles within Nigeria um, to try and um, uh, end that, um, that, that devastation that Shell was involved in in Nigeria, right? Which was bound up with uh, political struggles against the military regime there, right? So you have this point of overlap right um same is going to be true of something like bea systems right when we have protests against the arms fair in london um it's not just about the peace movement in britain or the arms trade movement in britain. it should be about all the refugee communities that have been displaced from their homes because of britain's arms trade with those other countries from which people have come and those regimes there right There's all kinds of other ways that, so so are we thinking enough about those overlaps those points of, of overlap that's the third thing thank you Thank you so much. Um, um, maybe just if people could stick with us for the next maybe five to seven minutes. I'm sorry to take so much of your time just for us to run through a few things. Um, thank you all. Arun, just to, sorry, just for our at attendees, I think maybe UK arms exports to Saudi are the biggest, but that, that definitely doesn't take away from the fact that still stands, which is the UK's relationship with the US um, and its huge um, arms sales. Uh, to the US and why that hasn't been a focus in a lot of anti-arms trade organizing. Um, there's, I just want to just uh, note that there's so much that we haven't talked about today in terms of militarism and borders and policing of different places in the world, but also um, different aspects of it. Like um, Arthur very powerfully elaborated on the environment, um, but maybe that's something that we can come back to in, the, in, in part two, but also, um, aspects of gender um, and what that means in terms of militarism, policing um, and borders. Uh, we haven't talked about the links, the very, very, very obvious links between uh, the UK government and selling, for example, uh, uh, equipment used, for example, by uh, now in Hong Kong or Bahrain, which there's police trainings. Uh, we've got like a, a master's course at Huddersfield University, which is dedicated only for um, Bahraini police um, uh, for, for Bahrain police forces. There's a lot that I think we haven't addressed um, and this is, this was only meant to set the foundations, um, give an overview I guess for hopefully what the um, our wonderful attendees and our speakers can come back to in part two um, where we can discuss these things uh, more in a more interactive way. Um, just to highlight, so there will be a part two, hopefully we'll send an email around. There will be a link again um, to sign up. Uh, if you'd like, if you're interested in, in uh, any of the things that, we've, uh, that have been brought up in terms of working on borders or policing or anti-arms trade activism, a lot of the social media accounts have been shared throughout this chat. Um, there's also the CAT website where you can sign up to updates and um, there'll be a reading group soon, I think, and a research uh, uh, training if anyone's interested. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Please keep this conversation going. This is for us to organize. Feel free to take this onto social media again with the hashtags and, and social media accounts that we, we shared. Um, but thank you so much for um, joining us and thank you so, so much to our speakers who I know through like, specifically really really busy times have made the time and capacity to be with us and share their 
wonderful insights. Thank you.